بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. إن شاء الله we're continuing with our series on the prophetic biography, the seer of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. In last week's session, we talked about the previous session rather we talked about the one of the very interesting experiences. That the Prophet ﷺ had during his childhood, um, and as we talked about the difference of narrations, whether he was 12 years old, and some narrations say that he was maybe a little bit younger. Regardless of the fact, you can understand his age to be about 10 to 12 years old uh, when the Prophet ﷺ had this very uh, interesting experience that he traveled with his uncle um, to towards the area of Asham. And over there they ran into the uh, famous monk of that time, that era, Buhaira. And how Buhaira was very fascinated to not only meet the Prophet wasallam, but he was very um, interested in confirming if the Prophet wasallam was actually in fact the Prophet of the last times that he had read about, that he, was, that he had some information in regards to. Now, and we talked about towards the end of the session how the Prophet ﷺ was brought back to Mecca and we talked about the difference of narrations and how majority of the books of Sirah basically say that Abu Talib himself chose to bring the Prophet ﷺ back. However that exactly played out is, um, is a detail. Nevertheless, the Prophet peace be upon him was brought back to the safety and security of Mecca and his overall family that was there. And the Prophet ﷺ continued to grow up as now a teenager in Mecca. Now, one other very interesting thing about the Prophet ﷺ's youth. So today's session will basically focus on the youth of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ growing up as a teenager. And what were some of his experiences? Now, it goes without saying, it's understood that oftentimes the most trying and testing part of a person's life can often be that youth period and that those teenage years. You know, I mean, it's adolescence, puberty, you know, and, and all the different changes in emotions to physical changes and everything that a person goes through. It's quite famous, even in our society, in our communities, even in today's um, culture, we're very familiar with the struggles of adolescence and how frustrating adolescence is and that age is for the adolescents themselves and especially for sometimes even for their families. You know, one of the biggest hot topic, hot button issues in our communities today is youth. What are we going to do with our youth? And so, but that's something that you have to understand that yes, there are some unique challenges today that, that really make it difficult to be a young person oftentimes. But one thing you have to understand is that that age of youth has always been very problematic, has always been very difficult, has always been very challenging. And that's something that is universal. Throughout time, throughout the world, at any given time and place, it's always tough to be a young person and to try to adjust to all the changes and to try to manage all these new emotions and all these new feelings and all these new temptations and inclinations and desires that weren't there before. You go from innocence to all of a sudden now being aware of the world and having a flurry of different emotions. And that, you know, from an iman perspective, that's very challenging. So that's always been there, you know, the, even when you read ancient Arabic poetry, I'm talking about Arabic poetry that is, you know, 1500 years old, even when you read ancient Arabic poetry, you see even those ancient Arabs talking about the junoon of shabab, right? Talking about the insanity, the literally the loss of sense that comes with being a young person. And so, and even in the seerah, and again, I, I, I always have to kind of uh, contain myself that I don't start talking about you know, future events in the seerah, but to, at the risk of you know, kind of jumping a little bit ahead, even during the, 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 the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ, during the nubuwa, during the prophethood period of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, there were instances, there were situations where, again, it was very difficult even for the Prophet ﷺ to manage youth a lot of times. Like that was challenging. You know, he would have to give special attention to the youth. We know the famous story about the young man coming and requesting permission for zina, right? The fornication. The Prophet ﷺ had to very specifically address that issue. Aside from that, there's actually a really, uh, really eye-opening incident at the time of the battle of Uhud. 
At the time of the Battle of Uhud, there's a very eye-opening incident or in the, in the events that led up to Uhud, that when the, when the Sahaba, when the Messenger of God, peace be upon him, received the news that the Makkans, the Quraysh are on their way here, there was a shura that was conducted, a council that was conducted by the Prophet ﷺ. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ, his own personal inclination seemed towards remaining inside of Medina, and defending Medina from there. The, some of the Kibaru Sahaba, the senior companions of the Prophet, may Allah be pleased with them, their inclination was also to remain in Medina, and defend Medina from inside of the actual boundaries of Medina. It was the younger Sahaba, the younger companions, who were too young to participate, many of them were too young to participate in the Battle of Badr, and we all know what the Battle of Badr was, right? It was absolutely amazing. It was one of the greatest things anybody's ever witnessed on this earth. You know, so it, it was such a huge manifestation of Allah's power and Allah's uh, um, grandeur and the truth was so manifest on that day that anybody that wasn't there on Badr was just waiting for the next opportunity that I need to be a part of that experience some way, somehow. And so the young Sahaba who felt that they had missed out they were really pushing. They were like, no, 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 no. Because staying inside of Medina and defending from there wasn't going to be out there open in the battlefield the way Badr was. So they said, no, we want to go out. We need to go out and fight. Young people, really, really excited. Not taking into account some of the you know, sensibilities that were being presented by the senior sahaba, none of that. And they became so riled up. They got so excited and they became so rowdy almost that the Prophet ﷺ ended up saying, okay, fine, we'll go outside. So young people, and eventually then they came back and they apologized to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ and he said, now the decisions are made, I've put on the armor, we gotta go out. And of course we know what transpired on the day of Uhud. Of course that was in the divine decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made happen in order to lead to that exact event and those circumstances is eye-opening, it's a lesson, there's an ibrah in that. And the ibrah is that again, that was the youth, right? So they're, 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 there's a flurry of emotions and there's a rush of energy. And sometimes not um, a proper handle on how to manage that energy and how to manage those emotions. So to summarize, being young has always been very difficult. Now the Prophet ﷺ is growing up as a teenager, as a young man, in Mecca. So, there's going to be, now there's other boys. Now, and, and so they might be involved in, there might be some good kids, there might be some bad kids. There might be sometimes decisions that, you know, a lot of times young people do things where if you're older, or even if you look back at some of the things you did when you were younger, you actually sit here and you look back and you think back and you say, what was I thinking? Like, I don't understand why I did that. I don't understand why anybody would ever do that, right? So that's, that's part of being young. So what if things like that are going on? Because they do happen all the time, especially not just being young, but then young boys, right? Running around in the streets and there's not... And it's not even a culture, a society that has like a rigorous school system. as a very disciplined school system. That there's not even like proper schooling. There's not like a proper educational system in place in Mecca. These are illiterate people. I mean, they're very cultured. They know poetry and they know their language very well. And they're aware of society. They know their history. They know their family lineage. There are certain types of knowledge or education that were valued in that society. But not the way we have it today where at the very least, you know, from 8 o'clock to 3 p.m., 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., you know, you have a little bit of peace of mind. You have some sukoon. Right? Because all the wild animals are locked up in the zoo, also known as the school. Right? So there's at least some type of reprieve, right? But that's not even that type of, you know, of a situation. Like if anybody who grew up maybe overseas in a more rural area in the villages and things like that, you know how it is. You're just roaming the street, you're roaming around, wandering around, doing all types of crazy stuff. Right? So that's going on. Now, that becomes interesting because we're talking about Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. At that point in time, it's Muhammad ibn Abdullah. It's just a boy. But sitting here now, we're looking back, it's not just some ordinary boy. It's Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is the Prophet of Allah, peace be upon him. So now, 
obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protects His messengers and His prophets. One of the side issues that's going to come up today as a side discussion to what we talk about from the life of the Prophet wasallam is a very important theological issue, meaning it's an aqidah, uh, an issue from aqidah, um, which is called Ismatul Anbiya. Simply put, it talks about how the prophets and messengers of Allah, peace be upon them, that they are ma'asumun, they are protected by Allah from falling into any type of reprehensible behavior. They're protected by God, they're protected by Allah from falling into anything that could be blameworthy, that could be problematic, that is not very prof- prophet-like behavior, it's not very prophetic behavior. Alright, well what about a few times in the life of certain messengers where something does happen, like Musa alayhi salam and the confrontation with the Qibti, when the man dies. You know, even the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam during Nubuwa, during prophethood, you know, when Abdullah bin Umi Maktoum, when the blind Sahabi comes, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi is a little bit frustrated or a little bit annoyed at him coming and interrupting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi speaking to them. Those types of incidents are divinely decreed and made to happen in order to teach us a lesson through them. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا So we are taught an example through them, through their example. So those types of very rare occurrences happen to teach a lesson. Otherwise, prophets and messengers alayhim salam are protected by Allah from falling into any type of bad, reprehensible behavior, something that could catch up with them. طيب, to protect their purity and the purity and the sanctity of the message that they will later be given and they will deliver and what they will represent. They'll represent the deen of Allah one day. They're dignitaries of Allah. They're messengers of God. Prophets of Allah. So they are protected from falling into these types of things. So during those young years of the Prophet Wasallam's life, there, there are some narrations about the Prophet Wasallam and some of what he experienced. There's two narrations that sound very, very similar to each other. Some scholars have actually gone to discuss these two incidents and try to reconcile whether it's talking about the same incident or not. Um, and was there some type of discrepancy in the reports? But nevertheless, it's safe, it's safe to say that this is maybe talking about two different incidents and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. I'll present both incidents in front of you, but as you'll hear, it sounds very, very similar to each other. One of the incidents narrated about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and this is actually, one of them is narrated where the Prophet ﷺ talks about being a young boy. لَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنِي فِي غِلْمَامِ مِنْ قُرَيْشِ That the Prophet ﷺ says, I can literally remember myself being just a young boy from Quraysh. I can remember being a young boy from the Quraysh. And he said, نَنْخُلُ الْحِجَارَةَ لِبَعْضٍ مَا يَلْعَبُ بِهِ So what we were doing was we were picking up rocks and moving them and stacking up rocks or building little things, like just playing around with stuff, playing with rocks, right? So we were either making little structures or we were, you know, playing some type of a game that required setting up rocks in a particular pattern or whatever it might have been. Allahu alam. So he says, I remember us doing that, but to be able to carry the rocks, what we were doing was that. A lot of times the dress in, that, in those days was that there was a lower garment that was worn, a lower garment that was tied. You know like hujaj, the ihram of a haji, a male haji, how it looks? Very similar to that. That was traditional Arab dress at that time. That was one form of it. Where you had a lower garment that you just wrapped around your lower body, your waist. Like a lungi, and what's in Arabic is called a nizar, right? And then you had an upper garment that was kind of worn around like a shawl that covered your upper body. And so, but a lot of times little boys, what they would be given to wear, because you know how kids are, they're running around, they're doing all this stuff, so they can't really manage clothing properly. So what would be done with little boys a lot of times is that they would just be given one garment to wear. And instead of that garment being tied around the waist, it would be tied like around the chest, and it was just one garment that was wrapped around them, and that's all they would wear so that they could run around and get crazy and do whatever they needed to do. And and also because sometimes financial circumstances didn't allow for people to have like, extra clothing, multiple pieces of clothing for just the kids who are just going to go out there and get it dirty and tear it up and destroy it anyways. So boys would just sometimes be wearing that one garment. 
So now the Prophet ﷺ describes that all of us boys running around and we were trying to move rocks around to be able to carry these rocks and some of them were kind of heavy and they're sharp and they hurt and can't carry them in our hands. So what some of the boys thought of as an idea was they basically took off that lower garment, all right, and they wrapped up a bunch of rocks in them and kind of slung them over their shoulder and that's how they were moving the rocks. So essentially as a consequence they were uncovered, all right, again, why would you do something like that, right? So, it, they're kids, that's what they do. So, they were doing this, they were behaving this way, and so all the boys were doing it, and in one narration, the Prophet ﷺ actually says that, I just tried to carry the rocks just like that, I didn't feel comfortable taking off my clothes, so I was just carrying the rocks however I could, it was very painful, and it was heavy, and I couldn't carry them properly. So all the boys started telling me, what are you doing? Look, at, look how we're carrying all the rocks, hurry up, just real quickly, let's move all the rocks, and then you can put your clothes back on, don't worry about it. So peer pressure, right? Very common problem, common issue. So peer pressure now comes into play. And so the Prophet ﷺ actually says that, I decided, yeah, we're just gonna move it from here to there, what's the big problem? I'm just, he was just a child. So he says, I started to remove my garment to be able to put rocks in it and sling it over my shoulder. One narration actually says that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ says, إِذْ لَكَ مَنِي لَكِمٌ مَا رَآهُ مَا أَرَاهُ he says, all of a sudden, it felt like I got slapped in the back of the head by somebody, but I couldn't see anybody. It literally felt like I got slapped in the back of the head, but I couldn't see anybody. Lukmatan wajiatan. It was really, really hard. Like I got like smacked in the back of the head. Right? Again, a kid, you have to get his attention. You know how kids are, you have to get their attention. Thumma qala, shudda alayka izarak. And then I heard a voice say to me, put your izar back on. Put your clothes back on. What are you doing? So, uh, well, what would you do in that situation? Okay, yes sir. Right? So he said, I put my izar back on and I just... فَأَخَذْتُهُ فَشَدَدْتُهُ عَلَيَّا ثُمَّ جَعَلْتُ أَحْمِلُ الْحِجَارَةَ عَلَىٰ رَقَبَتِي And then I said, no, I'm not taking my clothes off anymore, forget about this. And then he said, then I just carried a rock like on my shoulder, on my back, on my bare back, just like I put my clothes back on, I just carried it however I could, even if it hurt, even if it cut me up or whatever, I didn't care, but I wasn't about to take off my clothes. That's one experience of the Prophet ﷺ. There's another narration, وَهَذِي الْقِصَّةَ شَبِيهَةٌ بِمَا فِي الصَّحِيحِ عِنْدِ بِنَاءِ الْكَعْبَةِ So this story closely resembles another incident that is narrated by some of the Sahaba رضي الله عنهم from Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. That later on, so this is talking about when the Prophet ﷺ was still what you could call a young boy. Later on, when he was maybe like an older teenager, an older youth, a young adult if you will, at that time, they were doing renovations of the Kaaba. And this was a really amazing opportunity. Everybody wanted to get in on it. I mean, you're, even if they were mushrikun, the Quraysh at that time, they still knew that there was something sacred and holy about the Kaaba. This was a holy sacred sanctuary. They knew that much. That this was a special place. Everybody wanted in on the action. Renovating the Kaaba, everybody wanted a piece of that action. So, and, and in fact, the, the high-ranking family members of the most prominent families were given first dibs to be able to participate. Alright? And so the Quraysh and the Banu Hashim and then the family of Abdul Muttalib, the great leader who had passed away, his family was given first preference. So his sons and grandsons. So Al-Abbas, the, grand, the son of Abdul Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, was there carrying rocks. And then at the same time, there was his grandson, this beloved grandson of Abdul Muttalib, Muhammad ibn Abdullah wasallam, And he was also given that opportunity to be some of the first few people to help out, carry some rocks, carry some bricks, carry some of the material, the raw materials, to be able to reconstruct the Kaaba, to be able to renovate the Kaaba. So this is going on. Now to carry these big bricks and everything, and of course it was kind of like a display of manhood as well, you gotta carry a big old rock for the Baytullah, for the Kaaba, al kaaba al Sharifa, right? And the bigger rock you carry, the bigger man you were, so everybody's trying to carry a big old rock. And the Prophet ﷺ lifts a big old rock and he's having a lot of trouble carrying it. Carrying it. So again, what some people start doing is, even if they are wearing an upper clothing, what they do is that they 
they, that upper clothing is on their shoulders, but it's still um, too difficult to carry the rocks. So what they do is again, they're removing like the bottom clothing and kind of readjusting the upper cloth. But what happens in that position is so you're somewhat semi-covered, but it's not proper covering, like you could easily be exposed. You know like the difference between wearing like pants and shorts, right? So it's a little bit more exposing by removing one of the cloths. So they remove one of the cloths, a lot of the, even the men are removing one of the cloths that they're wearing, all right, one of the uh, one of the pieces of clothing that they're wearing, and they rack up, wrap up the rocks in that or the bricks in that, and then they're again slinging it over their shoulder on their backs, and they're trying to carry it. So the Prophet ﷺ is struggling to carry uh, one of these bricks or rocks. So his uncle Al Abbas, radiAllahu anhu, would later accept Islam. He says to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu "Ijal izaraka ala atiqi ala min al hijara." So he says that, why don't you, you know, put one of your pieces of clothing onto your shoulder and then carry the rock in that. It'll be a lot easier if you carry it that way. فَفَعَلَ So the Prophet ﷺ started to do it. The narration says, and Al-Abbas is narrating this. He says, فَخَرَّ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ فَخَرَّ إِلَى الْأَرْضِ All of a sudden the Prophet ﷺ just collapsed. As soon as he started to remove one of the pieces of clothing because his uncle told him to, he just collapsed. It's like he passed out. وَطَمَحَتْ عَيْنَاهُ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ And his eyes literally just started looking up at the sky. Like his eyes just kind of rolled up and he just started staring up into the sky. ثُمَّ قَالَ إِزَارِي إِزَارِي Then he stood up and he said, where, where, where's, my, where's my clothes? Where's my clothes? And he immediately took his clothes and فَشَدَّ عَلَيْهِ إِزَارَهُ He wrapped his clothing back on and he put his, all of his clothes back on. And... One of the other more extended narrations actually says that that Abbas asks the Prophet ﷺ, "Well, what's what's wrong? What's going on? What's what what happened to you?" فَقَامَ وَأَخَذَ إِزَارَهُ وَقَالَ إِنِّي نُهِيتُ أَنْ أَمْشِيَ عُرْيَانًا I have been forbidden from walking around not properly clothed. I've been forbidden from exposing myself and my, my, my body, like my private parts, in public. I've been forbidden from doing this. So when he passes out, and Abbas runs to him and looks at him, and he sees the Prophet ﷺ, his eyes are just fixated on the sky, and he stays like that for some time, and Abbas is just looking at him, and he's not looking at Abbas, he's not responding to anyone, he's just staring up into the sky, and he stands up and he says, Izari, Izari, where's my clothes, where's my clothes? And he puts them on. So Abbas pulls him aside, and says, well, what's going on with you? Everything okay? You're acting strange. And then he tells Abbas, he tells his uncle, I've been forbidden from exposing my body in public. And Abbas actually says, He says, I never told anybody about this before. He narrates this after Islam comes. He says, I never told anybody about this before because they might have said, oh, he's crazy or something. That he freaked out like that. And who's telling him not to expose himself? Why is he randomly saying he's being told things? But this was of course again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him collapse, pass out. And when the Prophet ﷺ looked up to the sky, something grabbed his attention. And he was told at that time. It was put in his heart at that time. Ilham. Or even, you know, this, this is like divine inspiration was put in his heart at that time. That no, 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 you don't expose yourself in public like this. So these are a few incidents that happened with the Prophet ﷺ during his young years. Where he was being protected by Allah. Now... There are, there's another incident like this that is narrated, but first what I'd like to do is I'd like to add something about what was going on or what the Prophet ﷺ's activities were as a young man, as a young adult, as, as, a, as a teenager, an older teenager. You know, because typically when you get into your upper teen years, then the focus starts to shift from just running around and playing and just doing whatever you want to do, and you actually start to concern yourself about life. You think about, you know, you turn 16 and you think about getting a job. You know, you actually start thinking about applying to colleges and schools. Like you start looking towards life a little bit. You become cognizant of some type of responsibility. We've talked about before how Abu Talib was a very, very simple man. To the point where he actually was in financial straits. He was in some financial difficulty. 
The Prophet ﷺ being a very mature, we talked about his maturity as a child, so imagine his maturity as a teenager. He wasn't oblivious to the fact that his uncle, who was taking care of him, in spite of having his own family, had very serious financial issues and problems. He was very cognizant of this. So the Prophet ﷺ was very motivated, he was very concerned about trying, finding some way to help out his uncle financially. So, what could he do for a job? At that time, you have to understand the culture at that time, the Quraysh were an elite tribe. And in the Quraysh, the Banu Hashim were an elite family. And then the Prophet ﷺ in the Banu Hashim is coming from the family of leadership. Abdul Muttalib's grandson. So, for a boy like that, in that culture which was a very had a very elitist mentality. You know, there were, there were classes in that culture, in that society. And it's, it's not correct, but that was one of the problems of jahiliya. So, it was not acceptable for the Prophet ﷺ, being of that, of that family, that he go and get some type of menial labor type of job. Like he couldn't cut grass. He couldn't start working construction. He couldn't go and start doing some type of like, physical labor like carpentry or deliver, be a delivery boy or a message boy or courier or something. These things were not acceptable. The family just wouldn't accept it. No, no, there will be disrespect to the family. You can't do that. Because the men of Quraysh were merchants. They were businessmen. Which was the most prestigious job in that society, was the most prestigious career in that, in that culture. To be a merchant, to be an international merchant. Where you go to Yemen and you go to Sham and you bring goods and you sell them. Being an international merchant is what our family does. I'm sorry, you have to be the doctor, right? So it was that type of, same type of culture. You have to be a doctor, you have to go to med school. Nothing else is acceptable. So there was that type of pressure in that community, in that society at the same time. Alright? The Prophet ﷺ was obviously too young, he was obviously too young to be traveling internationally and doing business. Plus based on his previous experience, Abu Talib wasn't going to hear any of it. So the Prophet ﷺ even went to Abu Talib and said, I'd like to join the next business trip and go and help out the family, make some money. Absolutely, you're not going anywhere. Because remember what Abu Talib had been told. So he wasn't about to let the Prophet ﷺ go out there. Plus we talked about how it was very difficult and so even they wouldn't take along too young of a boy anyways. And he couldn't do any of the labor work so what was he supposed to do? There was only one other job that was deemed somewhat acceptable. In that community, in that society, even for the child of an elite family. Because of the way that that type of work was viewed, it was valued not necessarily for the work, but it was valued for the tarbiyah and the training that that work would provide. And that work basically was shepherding. To be a shepherd. That was acceptable. Because again, when you made your, when even the chief of the clan, the chief of the tribe, made his son a shepherd, it was understood. Oh, he's trying to teach him, he's trying to teach him some good qualities. He's trying to teach him to be a leader. It was viewed by the Arabs in that culture as something that teaches you leadership. They understood that about it. So, it was, that was the only thing that was acceptable, that he could be a shepherd. So the Prophet ﷺ took the only job that was available to him, which was being a shepherd, to be able to help out Abu Talib and to be able to help out the family. So you see the maturity and the responsibility and the family mindset, the family concern of the Prophet ﷺ, that he was very early on, very cognizant of family and wanting to help out the family and very concerned about the family. So the Prophet ﷺ becomes a shepherd and we of course know that this also works, this also plays a very important role in the divine tarbiyah of the Prophet ﷺ, to be a shepherd. Right? Because of the qualities that shepherding teaches. It teaches you patience. It teaches you to be observant, to be cognizant, to be aware and conscious of what's going on around you. To be responsible. Because if you're out there shepherding and you become irresponsible, you decided to just pass out and take a nap under a tree, well you're gonna wake up to find half your flock gone. And now you're in trouble. So you gotta be responsible. I can't just doze off because I feel like it. I can't go hang out with my buddies because I feel like it. I got, I'm responsible here. And you have to be always, you know, vigilant. You have to be alert all the times. All the time. 
because of your responsibility of the flock. And because what you're shepherding are sheep. They're very simple-minded creatures and animals. Right? Very easily distracted. Wandering here, wandering there. So you always got to be vigilant. You got to run there, bring them back in. Then you got to run over there, then bring them back in. So you're always on your toes, always keeping an eye. But at the same time, while being very vigilant and being very active and being very cautious and alert, you also still got to remember to be gentle. Because remember, you're not herding buffalo. You're not herding cattle. Right? Where they can take a little bit of a beating. You know, you could, you could throw rocks at them, you could kick them around a little bit. You know, if you even go to, you know, everybody here lives, you know, in the city and civilization now, so we're not very used to it. But even if you go to um, like a ranch or you go to like a, like a slaughterhouse or where they have these types of animals, you know, you know what, that, they, what that's called? That, that's called a cattle prod. You know what a cattle prod is? It's basically a stick that the ranchers use. It's like a long stick. And what does it have at the end of the stick? It's got like an electrical current there. It's got a battery on one end. It's got electrical current. What do they do? They shock the cows. Because sometimes they're stubborn and they're big animals. Right? They weigh 10 times what a human being weighs. They're huge old animals. And so you can't really move them around. You can't push them around or they're not responding, reacting. So you give them a little bit of an electric shock. Right? I mean, my point is that they can take a little bit of a beating. But you can't do that with sheep. It'll die. Right? So, what, so you still got to remember to be gentle. And so when you factor all these things in, it's perfect training to manage human beings. Because if there's any creation of Allah that's capable of being more distracted, more absent-minded, then even these, this livestock, sheep, it's the human being. Right? What do we call the common people, common populace? They call them sheep. Right? And what does even Allah say in the Quran? <laughs> They're even more, you know, uh, distracted and more absent minded than even livestock. So that's the predicament of the human being. But at the same time, the human being is also very frail. We're talking about the frailty of sheep physically. The sheep is a very frail animal physically. With human beings, you have a whole nother mess of issues because a human being is very sensitive emotionally. I mean, you could yell at a sheep all day long and he won't care, he'll just look at you. You call him all types of horrible things and bad things and yell at him and he'll just look at you, he doesn't care. Right? But a person, a human being, if you didn't just speak to him in the exact right fluctuation of tone, I can't believe you spoke to me like that. So managing people is a lot more difficult than managing even sheep. So it's training. And there's even a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where the Prophet ﷺ says, that, says that all the anbiya and all the rusul, all the messengers and prophets of God, peace and blessings of Allah be upon them, that they were, they were all shepherds. That they all were trained through shepherding livestock, animals, sheep and goats. Right? And then the Sahaba asked the Prophet ﷺ, even you, O Messenger of Allah? He said, yeah, even me. And he told them the story, he told them about his, in his young days, be, serving as a shepherd. And there's even a verse in the Bible where Jesus, peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salam, you know, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allahu a'lam as to the you know, exact uh, authenticity of that, but it's a very interesting verse from the Bible that at least makes sense because it, 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 uh, it checks out with what the Qur'an and the Messenger of Allah ﷺ taught us. Where Jesus told His disciples, Jesus told His students, told His disciples, He gave them instruction, He said, shepherd well. Shepherd well. That makes sure that it, when He's talking to them about leading the people after He's gone, He's telling his, instructing His disciples to lead the people after they're gone. He doesn't say lead well, He says what? Shepherd well. Right? So this is a consistent teaching throughout all the teachings of the Prophet, the Prophets, Anbiya alayhim salam And this was one of the ways in which they were trained. So the Prophet ﷺ is a shepherd. And I gave you that little, because it's, it's a part of that youth of the Prophet ﷺ, his teenage years. And it also factors into the next story um, that, I, that I wanted to mention here tonight. And that is that the Prophet ﷺ, this is mentioned by Imam al-Bayhaqi, rahimahullah, in his book at dalail that Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, says that the Prophet ﷺ told me this story. 
The Prophet ﷺ told Ali radiallahu anhu this story. He says that the Prophet ﷺ says, مَا هَمَمْتُ بِشَيْءٍ مِمَّا كَانَ أَهْلُ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ يَهُمُّونَ بِهِ I never really felt like indulging in the different things that the people of Jahiliya used to indulge in. Like, you know, bad things and useless things. I never really had a strong inclination to go and indulge in those things. You know, but he says, except for a couple of occasions, I was curious more than wanting to do it. I was just kind of just generally curious. And he talks about the time when he was this young adult, this young man, working as a shepherd. And there were other young men who also worked as shepherds from the Quraysh, from different families. And when they used to get together out in the fields with their flocks, we used to kind of socialize, we would talk a little bit, like what's going on, how's it going, how's work, how's... things like that, we would talk on the job. And one thing that they always used to discuss was they would always tell all their stories about the night before. Like, yo bro, I had up a crazy party last night. Right? Like, well, you'd be like, man, you look really tired, you got no idea, bro. Like, seriously, right? So, they would always be like, Young people talk today, unfortunately, right? Not condoning the practice. We understand, I'm trying to explain, contextualize. So, they'd be telling each other their stories from last night. What happened with me? And I went there, and I had, this happened, and that happened. And I met her, and then that, and then this, and all this crazy stuff. So they'd be talking. And they would always ask the Prophet ﷺ, what about you? What was going on? He's like, nothing, I went home and slept. And they were like, really? Like never? You don't? And so they said, they told me, they said, you know, there's going to be another party tonight. Why don't you at least just swing by, just all right, don't, don't hang around, just swing by, just kind of check it out. They knew that, you know, Muhammad's kind of a straight-laced guy. Muhammad's like a really, really decent, legit guy. But nevertheless, you know how, again, that peer pressure works? So at least just, just, just swing by. I mean, you don't have to do anything, just check it out. What's going on? So at least you know what's up. And so the Prophet ﷺ says, I spoke to, I had a shift that evening with the flock. So I spoke to one of the other young men, one of the other workers, and I said, do you think you could cover my shift? Because I wanted to go check out the party that they were talking about. He's like, yeah, sure, man, I got your bag. You, you need some party and go. Right? So the Prophet ﷺ says, I start making my way there. I start going towards, they told me the party will be here and here and such at this place. And I started going towards there. And he says, when I got kind of close, it was like inside of a home or a house, and I, I was near it, I was outside of it, and now I could start to hear, I could see a fire was lit inside, like there was a fire going on, like they were cooking food and probably you know, smoking some stuff or drinking some stuff. And, and I heard loud noises, the type of noises and laughing, that people may, you know, that the type of sounds, like they basically sounded drunk, to put it very uh, openly, they sounded obviously drunk and intoxicated, like loud, rowdy people, like a bunch of dudes in a bar. So they sounded loud and rowdy. And at the same time, I could hear women's voices singing. So that means they had some type of song or dance girls there, right? And a lot of times there would be jariyat, there would be um, slave girls, who were bought simply for their ability to sing and dance. They were entertainment slave girls. And they would be rented out or they would be hired out from their masters uh, for these types of occasions. So that the youth could engage in these types of um, you know, inappropriate activity. So he says, I'm outside of the house now. I can start to hear you know, some girls singing. I can see that the fire is going on. They sound really loud and rowdy, obviously drunk and intoxicated. And I start to hear some of this and I kind of stop because I hear all this and I'm not accustomed to this scene, I'm not used to it. And then before I could take another step forward, he says, I literally just passed out. That just collapsed. Just hit the ground. And he says that I didn't wake up until I felt the sun on my face. This was late at night. It's like 10 p.m. midnight. And I wake up at 7 a.m. and I only wake up because the sun is bearing down on my face. So I wake up and everything's over, everybody's gone, fire's put out, place is empty, the club is locked up. It's all over. Party's over. So I said, all right, I guess so. So the next day I go back 
I go show up to work that day again, all the guys were like, so, did you check out the party? And some guys were at the party, they're like, we didn't see you at the party, we thought you were going to come. And he's like, I tried to come, but then I just fell asleep. They were like, man, you're so lame. Right? So, then they put some more pressure on. They're like, tonight, you got to come to the party. That's it. Tonight, you got to come to the party. I'm working this, I'm working tonight. So then, guys, don't worry, he'll cover your shift. You're all set, you're all good, be there tonight, come on. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, again, young man, I start making my way towards the party again. I again get outside of the house, same scene, it's the club, you know, strobe lights on. I can hear the loud, obnoxious techno music in the back, right? Terrible. And people like, you know, getting all rowdy and drunk and just tear, you know, the whole scene again. And he says, before I can even take a step forward, passed out. Literally hit the ground. And again woke up the next morning with the sun on my face. And everybody's gone. So I come, I come back that day. I again go home and then I go to work and everything. And then they ask me, they're like, where were you again? You still didn't show up again. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in one narration, um, he just then, he actually continues with the narration, and he says that, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا هَمَمْتُ وَلَا عُدْتُ بَعْدَهَا لِشَيْءٍ مِنْ ذَلِكَ حَتَّى أَكْرَمَنِي اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلْ بِنُبُوَّتِهِ And then he says that, I swear by Allah, I never ever had any desire to go back to something like that, and I never had any inclination, nor did I ever even slightly make an effort to go to any such type of a scene, until finally Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with prophethood, and blessed me with nubuwa. So, this is a really really fascinating story from the youth of the Prophet ﷺ in his young age, and how he was a youth in that society. There's a very interesting balance here where he's a young man in that society. It's not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, locked him in a bubble to completely preserve and protect him. And then he was unlocked out of some, you know, uh, ice chamber and he was popped out of some bubble, you know, when he reached the age of 40, then now the Prophet has arrived. Right? That type of stuff is for comic books. But the Prophet ﷺ grew up in that society, was a young man in that society. All this stuff was going on around him. So he was cognizant of what was going on around him, but yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him from being involved in such activity. Allah protected him. This is the isma of the Prophet ﷺ. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protecting and preserving and keeping the Messenger of Allah ﷺ pure, pristine. And so one of the lessons we learn from that is that Two things I wanted to mention specifically in light of this incident, what we can learn from that. Number one, we definitely want to protect our youth. And if young people are listening to this, you want to protect yourself. But at the same time, notice that for the Prophet ﷺ to be a da'i, for the Prophet ﷺ to go and preach and teach these people, he has to at least know where they're coming from. He has to at least have just a general idea of what goes on in society. So there's a protection, but yet not the word that we use, sheltering. The Prophet ﷺ hears these boys talking. He knows where the party's going on. He doesn't go in the party himself, but he knows that there's a party going on. So that when the time for preaching comes, the Prophet ﷺ has the ability to say, I know exactly what you guys are up to. I, am, I, I know what, what goes on. I understand you know, what you guys are involved in. But this is, this is why you shouldn't be doing those things. And that's the relevance that comes into the practicality and the relevance that comes into preaching and teaching. That's one thing. So you see where the Prophet ﷺ has a job. And he's a young man. You know typically our idea of raising our youth, because the only way to protect them is, we have to lock them in the masjid. In the prayer hall of the masjid. Right? Just lock them up in the masjid, put a tasbih around their neck, Allah, Allah, that's it. And that sadly need to grow up. But the Prophet is out there in society, and he's growing up, and he has a job. And there are other youth that he interacts with. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing the divine tarbiyah of the Prophet You might say, well Allah is doing the divine tarbiyah of the Prophet Allah is protecting the Prophet of Allah Yes, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then through that 
that same messenger, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Muhammad Rasulullah, Allah subhanahu wa taala gave us the Quran and gave us His life, and those are our tools of tarbiyah now. We have guidelines, we have instruction in the book of Allah, in the life of the Prophet ﷺ, so that we can let our youth and our children be regular people, regular human beings, being functional in society, but then instill within them the values and the tarbiyah and the discipline that is necessary to be able to make those types of decisions and to be able to stay away from bad and harmful things. And But at the same time, one other lesson that we learn is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala divinely intervened and made the Prophet pass out. That also this teaches us that sometimes we do have to intervene. You know, I always say we're a community of extremes. It's one way or the other. Either one approach to raising young people in this society, lock them up and throw away the key. And we'll figure out what happens with them later. Now if they become dysfunctional and they don't know how to function in society, then we'll deal with that later. The opposite extreme is, no, let them go out there, let them experience, let them live. Alright? Nearly kills himself, driving drunk, let them live, let them experience. That's how they learn. They say the bread of Right? That's how you learn. No, 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 that's, that's, that's insanity. That's insanity. That's feeding your children to the wolves. There's a balance. Don't make them dysfunctional. Allow them to function in society and learn how to be a functional member of society. But at the same time, intervene when necessary. Put down the foot when necessary. Put some limitations when necessary. All right? And so we learn the balance of tarbiyah from the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And the second thing that I wanted to mention in light of this particular incident and narration is how the Prophet of Allah وسلم, was protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from falling into any type of sin, any type of inappropriate behavior or activity. And this was again, like I mentioned earlier, protecting the purity uh, of the message and of the carrier of the message sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this was later something that became a very prominent aspect of the life of the Prophet sallallahu and his own personality. This was something that manifested itself within his personality. Usama ibn Zayd narrates from his father, Zayd bin Haritha. Now if you remember who Zayd bin Haritha is, or maybe we haven't talked about it in a lot of detail, we will later on, inshallah, in the seerah. But to briefly summarize, he was kidnapped originally from where he lived, and he was sold into slavery. Of course, you know, uh, the, the people in Mecca, Khadija radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, did not know that he was kidnapped and then sold into slavery. He was just being sold as a slave. So he was given to her, or she purchased him as a slave, and then at the time of the, her marriage to the Prophet ﷺ, she gave this slave, this boy, Zayd bin Haritha, to the Prophet ﷺ as a gift. Uh, at the occasion of marriage. And so, and the Prophet ﷺ always treated him like a son. And later on would literally free him and then adopt him as a son. But nevertheless, he was always treated by the Prophet ﷺ like one of his own children, like a son. Zayd bin Haritha says that, I was walking with the Prophet ﷺ, or he says, we went to the Kaaba, the Baytullah, and one type of activity that the Prophet ﷺ used to engage in, as a meditation or as a form of worship, ibadah if you will, um, even before Nubuwa, was that the Prophet ﷺ would do tawaf of the Kaaba. He used to do tawaf of the Kaaba. Because he felt comfortable with that. He wouldn't worship the idols, he wouldn't go and sit in front of the idols and worship the idols because he said it doesn't feel right. Something seems wrong. But he would do tawaf of the bait, tawaf of the Kaaba, because he said something feels right about this. This seems correct. So he used to do tawaf. So he said one day he took me along with him for tawaf, and one of the idols that was there in the haram around there at that time, كان sanam min nuhas, that there was an idol that was made out of uh, copper. There was an idol that was made out of copper. And the Prophet of Allah, uh, Pro, we, I was doing tawaf with the Prophet wasallam, and he says that there was this idol made out of copper and it was called Isaf or it was called Na'ilat. But he says, I can't remember exactly what it was called. It had one of these two names. And he says, 
as the mushrikun would do tawaf, they would kind of go past that idol and they would rub their hand on it as they did tawaf. They would rub their hand on that idol, and that was their shirk that they were incorporating into the tawaf, and they would do this. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ would never do this, he would just do tawaf close to the Kaaba and avoid all the idols that were sitting around, uh, around the Kaaba, uh, farther off into the mataf. But he says, I was with the Prophet ﷺ, and what I did was, as we walked by, I stretched out my hand, because I, he was a kid, he was a little boy, I would see everybody rubbing their hand on the idol as they walked by. So I stretched out my hand to wipe my hand on the idol as well, and the Prophet ﷺ kind of pulled my hand back, and he said, don't do that. He said, don't, لا تمسوه, لا تمسوه. Don't, don't rub your hand on it, don't touch that idol. So Zayd says, Tufna فَقُلْتُ فِي نَفْسِي لَا أَمَسَنَّهُ and he said, we kept on doing tawaf, we continued to do tawaf, and then as a little boy, again, you know how the attention span? Right, kids' attention span, it's like... So, he says, we're doing tawaf again, and I see everybody again rubbing their hand on it, and I got excited again, I was like, ooh. So I went to go touch it again, and when the Prophet ﷺ saw, حَتَّىٰ أَنظُرَ مَا يَكُونُ فَمَسَحْتُهُ فَقَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم, أَلَمْ تُنْهَى then again the Prophet ﷺ pulled my hand back and he says, didn't I just tell you? Weren't you just told not to do this? So we see that early on, we see the Prophet ﷺ being protected from in falling into any type of bad activity, bad social activity, any type of sins. But we also see that from very early on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilled within the Prophet ﷺ, much like we read about in the Qur'an about Ibrahim alayhi salam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilled within the Prophet some this natural hesitation, apprehension, severe dislike for idol worshipping and for shirk and such activity as well. And it's also mentioned that sometimes when the Prophet some would just be engaging in conversation with people, that you know sometimes when you're just talking, he'd be talking business with somebody or he'd be talking somebody. So you know how you tell somebody, say wallahi, Say wallahi, swear that that's really what happened. Say wallahi, say, swear that that's really what happened. You know, it's a part of just normal conversation. People say that to each other. When you say something very surprising or shocking. So in that culture at that time, when you would say something out of the norm, they would say, Aqsim billati wal uzza. Aqsim billati wal uzza. Swear by Allah and al uzza. Right? Those were the names of the two most prominent idols that the Quraysh, that the Makkans used to do shirk with. So they used to say, swear by Latin Uzza. And whenever somebody would say that to the Prophet ﷺ, to this young man Muhammad ﷺ, swear by Latin al Uzza. The Prophet ﷺ always used to tell them, لا تسألني بهما. لا تسألني بهما. If, if you want me to take an oath to prove to you what I'm saying, don't ask me to swear by Latin Uzza. And he used to say, فَوَاللَّهِ مَا أَبْغَضُ شَيْئًا بُغْضَهُمَا Because I don't hate anything as much as I hate a Latin Uzza. I just don't even like hearing their names. Don't, 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 don't say those two words to me. And he would immediately distance himself from that entire conversation because he didn't like talking about those things. So this is a little bit about the tarbiyah, the upbringing, the youth of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, that the major challenge of youth is the social evils and social sins and these types of you know, lust and desires, and how the Prophet ﷺ was protected from falling into those types of things. And then of course the second challenge that is even manifests itself today is a spiritual challenge and the faith issues that youth deal with, which of course was a big issue at that time because it was the time of Jahiliyyah, it was the era of shirk, the era of idols. Right? It was zamanul, uh, uh, zamanul asnam, it was the era of idols. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even protected the Prophet ﷺ from that by naturally instilling within him just a natural apprehension and aversion to anything that had to do with the idols. And I'll end today's session, I always try to end with some type of, you know, a takeaway type of lesson, something very powerful that we can learn, and that kind of increases us in love for the Prophet of Allah ﷺ. Ibn Ishaq, the famous scholar of Sirah, in his book of the Sirah, he's got some very poignant words, he's got some very beautiful words, in which he talks about the youth of the Prophet ﷺ and his upbringing. He says, فَشَبَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم يكلأه الله ويحفظه ويحوطه من أقذار الجاهلية. That the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم began to mature into a man, and Allah سبحانه وتعالى protected him, and He guarded him 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally set up a boundary and a perimeter around him to keep away the filthy things of jahiliyyah from coming close to the Prophet لِمَا يُرِيدُ بِهِ مِنْ كَرَامَتِهِ وَرِسَالَتِهِ Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended him to be a very noble, great messenger and prophet of God later on. حَتَّى بَلَغَ أَنْ كَانَ رَجُلًا أَفْضَلَ قَوْمِهِ مُرُوءَةً Until the Prophet ﷺ grew up to become the most virtuous man of his people when it came to dignity, like, manly, like manliness, like chivalry what we call. That he became, grew up to become the most chivalrous, most honorable man in his society, in his community. وَأَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا And he became the most exemplary individual of his people when it came to character, and, and conduct, akhlaq. Wa akramuhum hasaban. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him from the most noble lineage of his people. Wa ahsanuhum jiwaran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him the most excellent company even. That even the people that he was surrounded with, people like Bilal, people like Abu Bakr, the young boy growing up that he kind of mentored growing up, Ali bin Abi Talib, the young slave that he had, Zayd bin Haritha, the wife that he was given. The first wife that he was given, Khadija al Kubra, radiallahu anhum, Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhim ajma'in, may Allah be pleased with all of them. So he was given very excellent company from very early on. Wa'a'adamuhum hilman. And he had great forbearance. I mean, he was always very calm and cool and collected. He had this amazing, just emotional fortitude and control that he wasn't volatile emotionally. He was very stable emotionally. Wa'asdaquhum hadithan. And he was the most truthful person of his people when it came to speech. Nobody could ever recall, even slightly Muhammad, ever even bending the truth. That's how he was. وَأَعْضَمُهُمْ amanatan. And he was the greatest of his people when it came to trust. You could trust nobody. There was nobody you could trust more than Muhammad Rasulullah Muhammad ibn Abdullah alayhi salam. وَأَبَعَدُهُمْ مِنَ الْفُحْشِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept him the farthest from any type of inappropriate, indecent activity. وَالْأَخْلَاقَ أَلَّتِي تُدَنِّسُ الرِّجَالِ And he gave him akhlaq and character which would literally put to shame other men. Like he would put other men to shame. تَنَزُّهًا وَتَكَرُّمًا That from, in terms of his nobility and how distant he was from anything that was bad. حَتَّى مَا حَتَّى مَسْمُهُ فِي قَوْمِهِ إِلَّا الْأَمِينَ And it eventually reached such a point, all of these qualities reached such a point, such a boiling point, that eventually the name that he was known by in his entire society was Al-Ameen. You know when somebody doesn't even know somebody's name, but they just know something about that person? Like, oh, Dr. Saab. Right? But what's Dr. Saab's name? Nobody knows. It's Dr. Saab. Right? Everybody knows Imam Zia, right? But it's just Imam Saab. Imam Saab. Maybe they don't even know his name. But they just know that's the Shaykh. That's the Imam. So the Prophet of Allah ﷺ would literally walk around in Mecca. Even if somebody didn't know his name, they just knew uh, Al-Ameen. They just knew. I, I just, I've heard about that guy. Al-Ameen. لِمَا جَمَعَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ مِنَ الْأُمُورِ الصَّالِحَةِ Because of all the amazing righteous qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had combined within the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is describing the youth, the teenage years, the adolescence of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and how he matured into a young adult. And inshaAllah, we'll pick up and we'll continue from here next week. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us all in our love for Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallahu wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka.